watch this vidcast or I'll gouge your eyes out. Welcome back, Horror Hounds, to Ghostman and Rivera's Horror Show Podcast. I'm Mike Ghostman Pickle. And I'm James Rivera. Today we have an interview with filmmaker uh, Carlos R. Valencia. We conducted a little mini interview with him about his film, The Chicken Party, currently streaming on Amazon Prime. And we're going to review that film a little later in the show, as well as review a short film on a short film called The Telltale Heart. Very fascinating. And Mike and I are going to dive into the notorious grindhouse cult classic, Cannibal Holocaust. But before we get to any of that, we have to get to... Horror Show News. All right, our first story is a sad one that everybody probably already knows by now. Halloween kills delayed until October 2021. Joe Bob Briggs, The Last Drive-In, renewed for a third season on Shudder. Writer-director Lee Wanell in talks to direct The Wolfman, starring Ryan Gosling. Scream Factory producing a 16-disc Friday the 13th set, and it looks spectacular. And finally, uh, my last story is Keanu Reeves wants to return as Constantine. And Ennio Morricone, the legendary film composer, passes at 91. Oh, man. That sucks. So, uh, as I said, Halloween Kills is delayed until October 21. Boo! But it has to be done because of the pandemic. They wanted to uh, ensure their success because the first one was such a huge, massive box office hit. It was done on fairly low budget for such a big studio movie, and it just cleaned up all over the world. So, uh, so it's no, gonna, no longer going to be released on October 6, 2020, which is what it's supposed to be. So Universal Pictures change the release date to October 15th. 2021 and Halloween ends has been pushed to October 14th, 2022. John Carpenter is, is of course involved again and released a new teaser which shows fire trucks racing to the scene where Michael Myers is being burned and uh, Jamie Lee Curtis and her daughters screaming and begging them not to put out the fire. So uh, John, Ca- John Carpenter told IndieWire, I love this quote, it makes me very excited about the film. John Carpenter says, Halloween Kills is already finished. The cut is done. They'll mix it in New York in the next week or so. Then it will be in the can. My work is all done. The movie is something else. It's fun, intense, and brutal. A slasher movie times 100, big time. It's huge. I've never seen anything like this. The kill count. Holy shit, dude. (laughs) You heard about what Jamie Lee Curtis said about it? What? She promised a masterpiece. Hmm. Oh, and Jamie, shit. Lee, and Jamie Lee Curtis doesn't talk like that. She doesn't go around saying this film is a masterpiece or this is one of the greatest things. So she seems pretty confident. And I got to say, that trailer was pretty fucking intense. It doesn't reveal very much. And it's only like, I think, 25, 30 seconds. Very yeah. much a teaser. But you get a feel for, I guess, the intensity that they're going to be going for with this one. I'm super stoked. I am very sad that we don't get it this year because it was one of the things I was most anticipating because I yeah. really loved uh, Halloween 2018. Flaws and all, not a perfect movie, but overall it was it satisfied me as a fan of the original uh, Halloween. But um, it's it's the right move. It's unfortunate, but it is the right move to 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 hold it off for a while, as much well, as I hate it. I'm I'm inclined to to believe Jamie Lee when she talks about how good it is. Mm-hmm. Because I'm a big proponent of the 2018 one, and I see people's complaints that it was too much fan service. You and I actually love the fan service part of it. That turned a lot of people off about it. But other than that, it's such a solid, well-made film that really captured the atmosphere of the first 70, uh, first film in 78. So I know that after they got that fan service out of the way. So I know in order for them to make a part two and part three and plan it all out. It has to be a really fucking good story. And especially to get John Carpenter excited about this. He doesn't just tout the merits of a movie just to make money. He's not a bullshitter. Yeah. If he said this, if he says he's excited about it and it's going to be good, then I believe him and I believe Jamie Lee. So I'm really excited about this one. It just sucks. I have to wait another year. So Joe Bob Briggs, the infamous horror movie show host, is being renewed for a third season on Shudder. Yes. Rob uh, Rob Briggs had this to say, I can't believe it's only been two years since the first marathon called The Last Drive-In. 
to have a third season conti and continue to experience the love and encouragement that daily pours out of the shutter community is more than I could ever have hoped for. It's been a very difficult year for all of us, but I hope we can continue to be a little oasis where people come to celebrate holidays and weekends and that special family feeling that only horror fans know. Uh, uh, shutter general manager, Craig Engler said this, the last drive-in continues to be a great success story for shutter trending in the top 10 on Twitter during each live Friday night episode and also driving tremendous on demand viewing. We're delighted to bring Joe Bob back for a third season. And we're also, and this is the important part, uh, planning some incredibly fun specials that we'll announce down the road. Um, one of the first specials that they're going to be doing is going to be a summer sleepover. It's going to be a double feature. Uh, it was uh, pre-taped prior to the quarantine, and it's going to have a guest spot from Adam Green, along yes. with a few other guests, and it will premiere Friday, August 14th at 9 o'clock. So uh, we actually are not going to have to wait a full year to get more Joe Bob picks because, like, I mean, he did uh, the Christmas special where he did, hosted all the Phantasm movies. So before the third season even arrives, we're going to get uh, different specials uh, sporadically leading up to that. So if you're a fan of The Last Drive-In, don't fret. You're not, it looks like we're not actually going to have to wait a full year before we see some more Joe Bob. And I got to be honest, I've been diving more into Joe Bob since his quarantine. I just watched Hellraiser with him, Hellraiser 2. Um, what was the one? Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer pieces. I'm, I'm actually sad that I barely got into Joe Bob when he, when he came on Shudder. I didn't even know about him before because I, I never had cable growing up. I grew up in the deep south where we didn't even have cable coming to our house. So I, I never seen him before. And when I started watching Shudder, it was immediately fell in love with the guy. His commentary, his wit, the movies that he plays, and and with Adam Green coming on too, I've been a huge fan and proponent of, of Adam Green, Adam Green's work ever since he first started with Hatchet. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that Joe Bob will play Frozen, which is my personal favorite Adam Green film. It's Adam's favorite film of, of his own. So what do you hope they'll play? You know what I would like to see Joe Bob do? Actually, <laughs> The Evil Dead. I want to see Joe yeah. Bob host an Evil Dead marathon. That would fucking totally be awesome. It seems like it's something that's right up his alley. I mean, uh, I, I actually am a little embarrassed that I had not heard of Joe Bob until you informed me about him. And when I realized that he had such a long history before, and for a whole generation of horror fans, he was like the introduction into horror, I felt like, yeah. how can I be such a horror fan and not know this man for so long? And um, supposedly, this is what you hear, according to um, Joe Bob and his co-host, Darcy the Male, the male Girl, who I love, they're um, digging up the archives for his old film, his old series, Monster Vision, that used to air on TNT. So oh, yeah. might actually be getting blu-ray like a blu-ray release sets because joe bob said please don't stream it from the crappy sites we're actually working on getting all those old ones back uh getting those ones on the market what's funny i didn't know who joe bob was before but it was because of his random part in uh martin scorsese's 1995 gangster film casino where he yeah. plays the hick that pisses off robert de niro <laughs> <laughs> when you mentioned the uh, evil dead i just started picturing Joe Bob sitting there with Bruce Campbell. Could you imagine Joe Bob mixing it up with Bruce Campbell? That would be a riot. <laughs> oh, Maniac Cop. That would be another good one for him to do a commentary on, the Maniac Cop films. That's like, another one he could have Bruce Campbell in for. <laughs> Make this happen, Shudder. Yes. And you too, Darcy. Dar Darcy makes a lot of shit happen for Joe Bob, so get on it, Darcy. I watched some of the older Joe Bobs uh, without Darcy the male girl. It's just as good, but I kind of glad that he added her on because it adds an alternate flavor i guess to the proceedings something a little bit different i think her presence uh actually enhances the show quite a bit there's been times where i've, I've even seen people complain about it like she'll be on her phone or something or she won't be investing too much in the show but but those episodes is just when she's concentrating on the social media thing because she's running their social media feed throughout the whole show but the, but the ones where she contributes to, I think she does a really good job with her contributions. Dumb complaint. You need your social media person in this day and age. The next one, we've been talking quite a lot on the show about Lee Wynell with uh, his Upgrade film and then him doing The Invisible Man. So I've really been waiting with bated breath to see what he's going to do next. 
Um, I'm half excited about this and half not that Lee Wynnell's in talks to direct Wolfman starring Ryan Gosling and uh, Bloomhouse and Ryan Gosling are both on to produce it for sure. But Lee Wynnell is not for sure. He's definitely writing the treatment and they want him to direct it. But uh, Lauren Shucker Bloom and Rebecca Angelo, who wrote for Orange is the New Black, are writing the script. So uh, Wano was not interested in it at first, but the writer, Lauren Bloom, she's Jason, Jason Bloom's wife. So Jason Bloom asked Lee Wano to reconsider. I think I have mixed feelings about this too. There's good and there's bad. Um, I'll get the bad and the negative, my negative feelings about it out of the way first. Um, Lee Wano is such a gifted filmmaker and um, I wanna see his original concepts because if you think about a film like Upgrade, spectacular movie i think it was really underrated one of the most underappreciated films of 2018 such an original imaginative concept well executed i would like to see him do more films like that i like the original visions um the other thing that bothers me is that lee wanell is not penning the script and yeah. that's a big part of lee wanell's personality he became a director and he's a good director now but first and foremost, he's a writer, and I have a hard time computing the idea that he's not going to be doing his own scripts. That doesn't mean the script won't be good, though. Bear in mind, it does not have to be written by Lee Wanell for it to be a good script, but I hope it has some of his input. On the other hand, as much as I'd rather him do original movies, we know that, like The Invisible Man, it's going to be a complete reinvention of the story, so much so that might as well be an original film. That's how I feel about the original man, uh, the original, the, uh, the invisible man, because it's, yes, it is based on a classic, uh, universal story, but he reworked it in such a way that the concept is totally fresh and totally new so much so that it might as well be an original movie. So if they can do something like that with the Wolfman retool it, it'll work. And also the other positive thing is Ryan Gosling, my boy, Ryan G, one of my yeah. favorite actors working right now. That guy has so much charisma. And I find it interesting that uh, he hasn't made a film since 2018's uh, First Man with Damien Chazelle, that his first film back, uh, back uh, in front of the screen is going to be a Blumhouse horror movie. And Ryan Gosling has such a presence and there's such, such an intes intensity that seems to be below the surface. And I, and I think he'd really bring that out as the Wolfman. But like, like you said, I don't like the idea of, of uh, Lee Wynell directing without writing it because he's a he's a writer first and foremost and then he's a director and i think the the strength of his directing relies a lot on the strength of his writing mm -hmm. so at least he's writing the treatment you know so i i don't understand why they would at least not let him have a well hopefully that's that'll be part of the deal that he'll have at least a pass on the script to add his touch in there because there's something special about lee Wynnell's writing that grabbed me right from the get-go and then, you know, he, he wasn't, I don't think he was that great of a director at first. He showed promise with the Insidious film that he did. But with Upgrade, he really showed a lot of uh, imagination and skill. And I think so I, I really hope he writes it. With The Invisible Man, it proved that his directing skills were, um, were, develop, were developing even more. Because one of the, the best things about The Invisible Man is the opening sequence is completely silent it's all visual completely cinematic and without any dialogue it manages to set up the scenario you can instantly tell even though you drop in the middle of a situation you get the feeling of what's going on and it's able to build up tension just through quiet perfect selection of images so it just shows that he is developing a lot as his 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 filmmaking skills but you know if it comes to pass I'm going to be excited for it anyway because I'll watch anything he does as a director, director now. Screen Factory is producing the 16-disc Friday the 13th Blu-ray set. And I had a chance to, I, I plan on pre-ordering it. Hopefully it's not sold out I, sometime this week when I get a, get a little more money and I want to pre-order it. This is a spectacular looking set and it looks like a Scream Shout Factory really outdid themselves and are working to make this a worthwhile collector's piece for Friday the 13th fans. It's going to be released on October 13th, 2020, Friday the 13th, on the 40th anniversary of the original film. 
It's collaboration with Paramount Studios and New Line to get all of them together. It's going to be a Region A release. It's going to be housed in a new collectible rigid slip cover case, and it's going to be packed with hours of, a, of special features that are already existing, as well as a bunch of new special features that we haven't seen before. Each film inside will have its own slip cover packaging and will receive a uh, dedicated Blu-ray case featuring the original theatrical artwork. Um, some of them will have reversible sleeve sleeves. Uh, if you go to the, the Shout or the Screen Factory website, take a look at this. This is a beautiful, sexy looking set. Um, it's going for $159.98, so basically $160. And it also includes a 40 page collectible essay booklet with archival still photography and a handful of posters that are going to come in it as well. So they really, really went all out with the set. And I hope by the time I get around to trying to order it, it's not sold out. <laughs> I'll say that much. Yeah. <laughs> and then we'll do a big uh, Friday the 13th episode after that. We'll watch all of them. Oh, yes. So mm -hmm. looking forward to that. Not much else to say about that one. But um, if you're a, a horror collector, if you're a proponent of physical media, this looks like you're going to want to snatch it up. The next story is that Keanu Reeves wants to turn, return as Constantine. I hope he does. Uh, director, the original director, Francis Lawrence, he also directed I Am Legend, which is, I, I, I think it's underrated. I think it's an excellent film. He says that he's been in talks with Keanu Reeves about developing Constantine 2. And, uh, but it was also reported this week that J.J. Abrams is looking to develop a new Constantine film with Warner Brothers, but it's not clear if he wants Keanu Reeves to star. It's not clear if he wants Francis Lawrence to direct. Keanu Reeves is on fire right now. He, he's, he keeps bringing back John Wick. He brought, he brought back Bill and Ted recently. Now he's bringing back The Matrix. And now he wants to bring back Constantine too. It's a bit confusing about exactly what are the odds of this Constantine happening with this original director? But here's what Dr. Uh, director uh, Francis Lawrence said. I think we all wanted to do it. It was successful enough. We wanted to make a responsible, more R-rated movie. By responsible, I mean we'd make a movie that wouldn't cost quite as much as the original, which we thought was going to be PG-13. We worked on the sequel for a while. It was tricky to come up with where to take it. What I really liked about the first one is it was really personal story, so I thought it'd be a mistake to get caught up in the supernatural gobbledy gobbledygook. The idea of a personal story was really interesting, and that was a hard thing to come across. We've been talking about it recently. It's always stuck with all of us because we all love the movie, and especially realizing that, that there's a real cult following for this movie, it'd be fun to make. Keanu, Akiva, and I have actually talked about it. Unfortunately, I don't even remember who has the rights to it. But with all these shared universes that exist now, with Constantine being part of Vertigo, which is part of DC, people have plans for, for these shared universes. You know, possibly different Constantines and things like that. Right now, we don't have the character available to us for the TV or movies, which is a bummer. We all investigated it, but I think it's kind of crazy when you have Keanu, who would love to do another Constantine, and us wanting to do another Constantine, and people are like, uh, no, we got other plans. We'll see what happens. So he's working on it. Let's keep our fingers crossed and hope that J.J. Yep. Abrams doesn't screw it up. Yeah, I think there's actually a, a strong possibility that it's going to get made. And the reason it being is that, um, well, I need to rewind a little bit for context. When the original Constantine came out, it didn't catch on in a major way. Uh, yeah. but I've noticed over the years, there's uh, more appreciation growing for it. Like I've noticed a lot more people really like it now. It has a cult following. And Keanu Reeves, well, he's always been big. I feel like he's a more bankable action star these days. He's a bigger star. I feel like the casting of him now is a lot better than it would have been at the time. So I feel like the times has finally caught up with it. So maybe when the movie came out, the, when they saw the returns, it didn't seem like there was many prospects for a sequel. But the way that the, the landscape has changed, the way that uh, Keanu Reeves has grown into a much bigger icon and a really bankable action star, um, I think the possibilities of this happening have increased markedly. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I remember liking Constantine a lot when it first came out. Mm -hmm. And I also remember a lot of horror fans didn't like it because back then, a lot of horror fans were just turned off by any kind of horror with a budget. Mm -hmm. They wanted their 
they wanted their horror films to be small and nasty slashers. You know, they didn't want to see the big blockbuster movie. And then being connected to the comic book universe, I guess, yeah. didn't help it in a lot of horror fans' eyes. The last piece of news is very sad. Legendary film composer Ennio Morricone passes away at 91. This man was a giant in the world of film. One of the greatest of all to compo greatest composers of all time. My personal favorite composer. Um, to horror fans, he's always going to be known as the composer for John Carpenter's The Thing. And here's the thing. John Carpenter always scores his own movies. It's one of the trademarks of his filmmaking. His style is the John Carpenter scores. You know that when he had a chance to work with such a legend like Morricone, it was... Uh, there was no way he was not going to step down and let him yeah. score your film, no matter how good of a composer you are. Um, he did a great score for that. He did a handful of Ar Argento movies and Argento movies and uh, different like Giallo movies, like Nightmare Castle, The Bird with the Crystal Plum Plumage, Cat and Nine Tales, a, Lit a Lizard in a Woman's Skin, Black Belly of the Tarantula, Four Flies on Gray Velvet, What Have You Done to Solange, and Exorcist Two: The Heretic. Um, he was actually a little interesting tidbit. Uh, Stanley Kubrick had tapped him to make uh, to do the score for A Clockwork Orange. Uh. Morricone's most uh, legendary collaborator was uh, Sergio Leone, and his probably his most famous score is uh, for The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, Clint Eastwood, which is a magnificent film score. But at the time, he was collaborating with him so much that Kubrick reached out to Morricone and asked him if he wanted to do A Clockwork Orange, and he said yes. <laughs> And then Kubrick, out of respect for Sergi Leone, talked to Sergi Leone, and Leone said, oh no, he's busy. He's gonna be wrapped up in my film doing something else. And this was actually not true. So <laughs> he was trying to hog him himself. So that was always one of his big regrets is that he didn't get to do the Clockwork Orange score like he wanted to. We should celebrate his life instead of being sad because 91 is a ripe old age to live to. And he worked well into his old age, uh, like when he did Hateful Eight just a few years ago. And that was cool. And he won an Oscar for his score for uh, Tarantino's The Hateful Eight. What yeah. I found really cool about that is he had um, won a Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, an honorary Oscar. Usually they give those Lifetime Achievement Awards out to people who have had an extraordinarily accomplished career, may have been nominated several times but never won. It is such a rarity to get a Lifetime Achievement Award and then win an Oscar after you get your Lifetime Achievement Award. And then yeah. had, uh, Tarantino used his music in a lot of films like Kill Bill, um, Inglorious Bastards, obviously the big Sergio Leone connections. And of course, having to finally get him to do the score for The Hateful Eight, which was, for me, one of the top five scores of the decade of the 2010s has to be yeah. Morricone score for the Hateful Eight. So, um, rest in power to a legendary icon, made over 500 films. It's hard to be a little bit too sad because he lived such a full life and his career was so, so accomplished. I can only dream of still doing great work like that into my 80s and 90s. And now, the interview with filmmaker Carlos R. Valencia. Enjoy. Horror show exclusive. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome to the podcast Carlos R. Valencia, the director of The Chicken Party, currently streaming on Amazon Prime, and of uh, Pseudo, a really cool short film currently streaming on IMDb. How are you doing today, Carlos? Good, good. Thank you for having me in the show, and I'm doing good. Today is nice weather, so not too bad here in California. So how are you handling your lockdown right now? Uh, it's been crazy. Good thing is I've been watching a lot of movies, and uh, just been writing a lot. That's that's one of the main things I've been doing for the lockdown, just doing a lot of writing. Watch. Is there anything? Is there anything that you had to put on hold because of the lockdown? Yes, we were actually uh, going to shoot in, in Japan this November, a little film uh, called Somewhere Far Away, and we we had almost everything ready, the finance and uh, the casting. And then of course, you know, this lockdown happened and now we're postponing to maybe two years from now if things look good again. Oh, wow. Yeah, I actually read today that um, experts predict that movie theaters are not gonna open again, like fully yeah. open again until mid 2021. So, uh, kind of, that kind of really put us 
on hold for a lot of things that we wanted to do. So um, to start off, uh, where did you grow up? Did you grow up in California? Yeah, I've been uh, here in LA for all my life. So you're reading to yeah. horror movies from a young age? Uh, yeah, usually it, I started with a bunch of like old Japanese films that I used to rent in this video store uh, down near my house. And one, one of the ones that really caught my eye was this old black and white film called Kuro Neko. And that was a really good little nice horror film from Japan. I don't think I've ever heard of that one. So or have you uh, House? House? Oh yeah, House. Oh, actually, we were just we were actually just talking about that movie right before. Oh, nice, nice. <laughs> Join the Zoom. I like to hear how uh, uh, filmmakers first got their start. So, what are the events that led up to you making your first short, The Last Checkmate? And is that how you first formed Casanova Pictures? Uh, bef before the last segment, we did a couple of little short films, and those were the uh, little films that we kind of put the team together. And the last segment was finally the one, you know, we finally put all, all the small resources that we had mm -hmm. on making uh, that film. And then we started a little bit, a little bit, did more short films, and we finally got to Pseudo. And after Pseudo, we did a, a trial run feature film called The Midnight Screening which mm -hmm. I have on my YouTube channel. It was something we did on a very low budget, very basic plot, a bunch of people waiting in line to see a movie. And we just wanted to see the, the challenges and the conflicts we had in making a feature film, because that was a whole different game in, as making short films. So that after the midnight screening and we got you know our feet on the water and we're like, all right, this is how it's gonna go. We did the chicken party. Okay. Very quick, uh, your short film Pseudo was written by the lead actor, Tony, I don't want to mispronounce his name, Tony Abate? Hey. Yes. Yeah. How did you uh, hook up with Tony for that project? Tony has been part of Casino Pictures from the beginning. When it's really, There's some old short films we've done with him. And uh, so he's been with us. He's been kind of like our leading male actor in Casino Pictures. So we've been, you know, using him a lot and, and he helped us out. And he actually came up with the script for Pseudo. And he told us, hey, let's shoot this film. And I read it and I was like, yeah, let's do it. I like it. And then we just went on and we both produced it. What draws you to him as an actor and makes you want to use him in multiple projects? Uh, first, he's, he's, he's really cool and uh, he's a great actor. And we kind of get each other as when we're telling the stories that we're trying to tell kind of dark stories and, and really complex characters. So we both kind of understand that we're on the same path when it comes to storytelling. Was that an apartment that you shot in, uh, pseudo in? Yes, it was an apartment somewhere in downtown LA. I don't remember where, but it was in downtown LA. Was it easy to get access to that apartment? Because it looked pretty nice. It looked, um, to me, it looked a little bit more upscale. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, it was a friend of ours that hooked it up for us. So we were lucky in that part. I noticed that you uh, write most of the films that you direct, except for Pseudo. What was it about that script that made you want to step out of the writing and, and just get into directing someone else's script? I think I really wanted to give it a shot of just trying to figure out, I mean, trying to do a script that wasn't mine, you know, and I wanted to see, it was an experiment I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Because as you say, I always did a lot of writing, but this time I finally said, you know, I want to do somebody else's script and he gave it to me. And he, he trusted me with the script. So that was really cool. So how did the idea for the chicken party come about? Uh, the chicken party is a little bit based on the true story. Okay. And, uh, me and the producer, Danielle, we went to South Korea for a vacation and we were lost just like in the chicken party movie and this group of uh, South Korean college students came up to us and you know they helped us out to find a way and um, after the whole conversation was over they told us how long we we're going to be there we told them till Sunday and they gave us a flyer and it said the chicken party and they said yeah come come to the chicken party this is a cool place to make international friends and to learn about each other's culture so basically that scene in the chicken party movie is 80 percent true the same, almost the same dialogue that we got from that moment when we experienced in South Korea. So the whole week we were debating if we should go or not, because you know we were kind of scared. Like we didn't even know these people. Should we should we try this? So finally, on Saturday we decided the day of the chicken party we decided to go, and 
one of the things in the flyer, it said, please wear blue so they can spot us. So we had, you know, I had a blue shirt. She had another blue shirt. So we finally got off the train stop that we were supposed to get off. And it was empty. It looked just so lonely and kind of scary. So we stay there for a little bit, you know, trying to figure out if we got the wrong stop or anything. <laughs> and then this lady comes up to us and she literally just comes up to us and she stares at us for a while. She looked at our blue shirt and she just said, chicken putty. And we're like, uh, <laughs> yeah. And she said, okay, come follow me. And me and Neil looked at each other and we thought that was it. We're going to die. This is the moment <laughs> they're going to kill us. So we, we kept, uh, you know, uh, following this lady, and she took us down this tunnel underneath the, the train station. And the lights were flickering. It was really scary. We thought it was the end for us. But after we got out of the tunnel, there was this nice, like, park area. And there was a bunch of, like, little picnics. And there was a, a bunch of people there and a lot of foreigners. And, you know, all the, I guess, the, the college students from South Korea, they were there. And after that, it was really cool. We played games just like in the film and, you know, they we introduced each other, told what part of the country we were from. And yeah, the red, nothing bad happened. <laughs> but <laughs> that was, and when we came back from our trip, we kept saying, we should make a movie about that. But the negative, if something really bad happened, you know, to our, in, in our trip. So when you were walking down, you said, uh, or you were walking did is there any point when you were walking towards there did you have any thoughts that maybe we should just turn around and run in the opposite <laughs> direction yeah we, we did actually we kind of, we looked at each other kind of single like should we just say we got something to do but it's so funny how scared you are of just being curious you don't want to you know mm-hmm. <laughs> so, like you how can you escape like just being hey you don't want to be rude, but at the same time, you're scared. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it makes it that much more interesting that so much of it was based on a true story. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, the first uh, half of the movie was. No, uh, you're saying the first half of the movie really was. So you dabbled in, in the, the thriller genre throughout your career, but you mostly did comedy, did like dramas and comedies and stuff. So what was it that made you want to dive into straight-up horror with Chicken Party? Was it just that experience that you went through? Uh, yeah, that I also not only that, but I also have always loved. I mean, the plan for us was always to make kind of like a '90s monster movie. So we wanted, but that's a little bit more of a bigger budget. So we wanted to just kind of dive into a little horror film and then kind of build up that way. But that story plus us always wanted to do a, a '90s kind of monster movie was the main goal. Your lead actresses were uh, Megumi Kabe and Ami Shimada. I hope I didn't butcher the names. They both really you. gave excellent performances. Um, how did you decide on those two actresses for the leads? Uh, Megumi Kabe actually auditioned for an older project that we were supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And it never went through. But I was really impressed by her acting. Mm-hmm. So when me and Daniel decided to write the Chicken Party to finally you know, make that film, we based the main character on her. Oh, okay. And then when we were finally finished with script, we pitched it to her and she, she went on board after that. But every other actor or character were, we did casting. You did casting, okay. So you didn't know any of the people who played the psychopaths before the film? No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> One of the many things that I like about this film is there a, there's a small hint of horror in the poster, a very small hint. And then throughout the whole narrative, it's very small hints. It's mostly a quirky drama without a hint of horror till about an hour in. Was it important to you to invest in the story and characters before you put them in this horrific situation? Yes, yes. We, the, the main thing that me and Danielle wanted to do was for hopefully for the audience to care about the, the sisters. Mm-hmm. That was the main thing we really wanted to do. So when the sister got separated and you know things started going bad, we really wanted people hopefully to feel, you know, for them. Before we started this podcast, um, you had uh, Mike and I were actually talking about the film House, and you actually brought it up right right <laughs> here. Um, was that an influence on this movie? Uh, does Mike notice that the, the, with the, with the two sisters going to somewhere kind of unknown? Was that kind of like an influence on your film? Uh, d- definitely the the quirkiness of House okay. was the infl- I really want I didn't want it to be too just you know horror or 
I, I, I try to add a little comedy, like weird comedy, mm -hmm. just just like in the house had that kind of really bizarre, but you know, awesome comedy that they have. So the house had a little influence in, in the film. You had uh, very diverse characters from different countries in Pseudo and in especially Chicken Party. Is that a theme among your projects or does it just depend on the story you want to tell? Uh, I think as of now, yes, that is a thing. Uh, most of the scripts I have and most of the ideas that I have right now are very international. And that's because when, since I was a kid, I've watched a lot of foreign film. So I've always wanted to make movies like, you know, from other places. Was it a challenge in getting this movie financed? A little bit, a little bit, definitely a little bit. We, the big, first half of the film, I was able to take a loan out, mm -hmm. but the, but I think what most, especially first time filmmakers for me for feature film, is that we forget about post production, uh, and how much post production is going to cost. And sometimes post production could cost as much as the production of the film or even a little bit more, you know, especially if you want to submit it to film festivals and even do a little bit of marketing if you want, do a lot of sound design and, and the music for the film. So we didn't really, you know, planned out post-production. We didn't think it was going to be that expensive. Mm -hmm. So it was, we had to find investors and, and, and people to invest in the, the second half of the making of the film. I wanted to ask you about the uh, the goth girl that rattles off tons of horror films, <laughs> and, and it's it's the kind that only a huge horror fan would be familiar with. So, did you add this scene for the comedy, or to hint at the horror that was coming, or both? Uh, it was definitely both. It was okay. definitely uh, both. Uh, we I like those films, and I was hoping that you know a horror fan will look at that scene and be like, "Oh, I seen that one. I seen that one." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's exactly what we did. I like that it was um a mix of mainstream horror classics and then obscure horror movies. Yeah. <laughs> For a horror fan, whatever. Exactly, exactly. Do you have any interesting on-set stories, anything that happened uh, on set, like challenges on set? Uh, the, the scene of the countdown, the countdown scene, was one of the most difficult scenes uh, we ever, in the whole production we had. And... We had all 14 actors on set that day. And we had uh, the whole crew members, mm -hmm. the makeup artists, the um, the gaff for the grip, all had to go through a light switch. Because you know how once you go to zero, all the lights turn off? Mm -hmm. So every of the crew member, makeup, catering, were all in separate rooms ready to turn off their lights. And the camera had to you know pan forward. And for a long time, we couldn't get it right. Either the camera panned too quickly and then the lights turned off, or the camera did slowly and then the lights never turned off, or just half the lights turned off. So it was just really crazy. And because we couldn't turn the air conditioner, we had 30 people on set in this little house, and everyone was just sweaty and you know just dying. <laughs> and we were just getting uncomfortable. And we're like, oh, we gotta get this right. <laughs> and it was just really, it was really, really tough to just, you know, have so many people on this little set and just everybody doing work because we had the lights had to turn off the actors were performing the cameraman and and his assistant were you know panning you know forward and, and backwards so it was really that was really a tough tough day for us and that little scene took us the entire day it, we didn't do anything else that day it just that little pan shot that took us a long time to lit it and shoot it how <laughs> long how long was the shooting schedule for your film I believe 23 days. What's the actor's name that was dressed like the elf? I didn't get his name. Uh, Schaefer Bourne. Yeah, I, I love that character. He's the first character to bring an element of danger to the story, and it's very subtle. Mm -hmm. So what was your thought process when creating this character? Because I, I thought he was the most compelling out of all the villains. Uh, it, it's funny. In the script, he wasn't supposed to do that, but during when we finally casted him and we were talking about the the characters and we did a couple of rehearsal he he just he always had this little moment of insanity in him and we decided to you know to add that in the script so we talked about it and like oh this is the scene where you kind of you start losing it a little bit and so on and so forth so yeah because of his performance we added that element to the script 
was That's the cool. emotional layer of that character already in the script because one of the 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 interesting things that i like about it is uh, in in the scene when like later when you see him trapping people uh he starts to reveal a little bit a, a, about his past and you start to feel at least i did i started to feel a little sad for him i wouldn't justify his actions but i understood oh. why he was the way he was were you trying to um add in an emotional layer to that character to try to get that feeling from the audience uh at first we weren't okay we just want him to be like just an evil guy but he brought some like i he did bring something to the performance that i didn't see before and because of his performance we were we actually were able to deep cuz the, the lines were all the same but i never thought of it being that kind of emotional conflict with the character but because of his acting i was like oh man this, let's yeah. we could do something more with this character i i love how the the party plays out because we get to know every character that arrived at that party and it makes it feel more dangerous like anyone could die at any moment and you don't know how brutal it's going to get so uh in in the context of the story why did they why did the villains wait the entire party before attacking and were they fattening them up or were they toying with them uh they were definitely toying with them we we, we wanted uh i when we talked to the for the main villain Samantha she, she we were trying to figure out like the reason for for them being toyed and for them is just a, these for the, for these villains is just a moment of kind of having fun with kind of playing with their food before they okay. you know okay uh so that's what we came up with like all right so you're, you're just playing with them and you know then the fun begins How did you get this movie on the just hit the festival circuit? Yes. Okay. So what we'll, Yeah. Oh, how we did, just got we got a couple of film festivals. Okay. And how did you get it on the festival circuit? Uh we 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 submitted to quite a lot. The first film festival we got in was the Riverside Film Festival. And then uh after that one, we got into more, but the, at first we were getting rejected a lot. <laughs> Oh, but okay. once once you i guess once the movie is in the film festival then other film festival you know start taking a chance on it i like a lot of the subtle but very effective practical effects so how did you approach the gore in the film because i noticed you did some creative editing to make it look more realistic uh the, the um we had a great good uh what's her name uh, marcy we, she was a um special effects artist for the film So we were we she knew we were a low budget movie and we told her this is the budget and she was able to find ways creative ways that we could play around in editing and also and camera angles for the for the special effects and since we didn't want it uh since we didn't have enough budget to create big gory scenes we try to find moments in the script where that's the moment we want to have a big gory scene or that that that's the moment we should have a good special effects sequence You know how you said this is sort of based off of a based off of a true story? Uh I mean a semi true story. Mm -hmm. Um how did you decide on uh Asian lead characters? Uh well we the first idea was for to make it look we wanted to make the film in Korea. Mm -hmm. We wanted to be Americans going to Korea and then get invited to chicken party. But of course that would be you know bigger budget and you know now you have to go travel international so we decided to switch the 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 story and at the time we also knew about Megumi so we wanted to work with her so we decided to change it from Korea to Japanese oh, okay and then that's how the story just started to kind of come together so how did the chicken party end up on Amazon Prime uh one of the re uh well first of all, we have to thank Megumi for that because um Megumi in a lot of the film festivals was getting nominated and she was winning awards for best actress. Oh, so wow. we were winning a lot for her. The movie was winning a lot for her and um we got into a this 13 horror competition and in that 13 horror competition Megumi won for best actress and they said, "Hey, you know, we really like this movie. We really want to help you distribute it on Amazon Prime." And we see that Megumi has won a lot, so this could kind of push the movie uh you know for Amazon and that's how we got in on Amazon because of 13 horror what is your upcoming project about 
Uh, the, you had to put on hold. The we had it was called Somewhere Far Away, mm -hmm. and it was just about uh, these two uh, friends that go to Japan to this like small little village called Katashina Village, okay. and they're trying to find themselves because they're they're so lost and broken as characters, and they travel through Katashina Village and and you know find themselves in a way. So do you plan on shooting that movie abroad? Yes, that one we we had we talked to the people in Katachina and they did approve of us going there. Did you want to continue uh, exploring the horror genre in your career? Yes, definitely. Um, we have uh, two films that are right now working and maybe since the whole this whole thing has happened this whole lockdown, we might have to do these two horror films. We we don't know which one, but one is uh, The Legend of Hania which is kind of a, a samurai horror film. And the second one is called Movelevant, which is a, a zombie film. We're, those are two, if you know things don't look good, we're gonna start just planning on shooting those films. Do you plan on keeping making movies about, uh, I guess, uh, foreigners in strange lands? I think for now, yes. Okay. I, think, I think that's kind of my, the influence I have right now. I mean, I could change in 10 years, I could be like, you know, I want to make sci-fi movies with robots. <laughs> but yeah. for now, I, I think this is, yeah, for now, this is the kind of movies I want, the kind of stories I want to tell and the kind of movies I want to make. Okay. So what happened with your uh, team investigating Supernatural TV series in 2013? It started out Tony Abate as well. Yes. What happened to that one? Is it, is it available anywhere? It's available on my YouTube channel. We did five episodes on, on that. And... Uh, we just ran out of money and you know it didn't hit as w w the way we wanted to so we kind of stopped but we did kind of uh rewrote it hopefully one day we can repitch it to a company that can you know that wants to approve it as a series okay so you also had a, a, a film earlier in your career i believe it was about 45 minutes long called uh, mendacity is that yes. available to watch or stream anywhere uh, yes, yeah, kind of. It Mendacity, but it's part of audio commentary, is available to watch also on my YouTube channel, Casanova Pictures. And it's not the it's the full movie, but it's audio commentary. It's just us, me, the director, and two of the actors in the film just talking about the making of that film and you know, the troubles we had during that shoot. Okay. So what what uh, classic horror films influenced you? Uh, as far as the horror genre, and what are some newer films that that uh, you like? Uh, for for the classic films, for, well, for for the Chicken Party, two of these films were really highly influenced. Was uh, Bob Clark's 1974 Black Christmas? Yes. And um, the uh, Funny Games with Tim Roth and Naomi White. No, no, that's, those were the two films that uh, really influenced the Chicken Party. And then for my, my, the ones I liked a lot, of course, uh, John Carpenter's The Thing and uh, Stanley Cooper's The Shining. Uh, and uh, from the newer film, I really liked uh, Frank Darabont's The Mist. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I think the, from those, those are really, those, from those three, those are my three favorite horror films. <laughs> What I noticed about the ones that you listed, they all deal with characters in confined spaces, which is kind of like how, how your film film works. Is that just something that appeals to you? Yeah, I think that's the scariest thing. You can't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> At least in other movies, you could run away, go to the woods, hide behind a tree, but when you're stuck somewhere, that's, that's it. That's all you have. <laughs> that's really scary. I don't want to be stuck somewhere. Like this lockdown. <laughs> but I think you have a very interesting style, and, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing more of what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Before you go, do you have any advice for uh, filmmakers? Any advice trying to get your film made? I think, from just from my experience, I think the advice I can give is that definitely plan out your post production. I think most people don't really know how tough post-production is and not only post-production but also for uh financing in putting movies into film festivals because that costs money and not only that but if your movie does, does get accepted to film festival now you have to also finance like postcards 
you know, you have to have a DCOP ready for them. So all this kind of starts adding up. Look, that's why I learned that you have to have a budget for both post-production and after post-production. Those are, those, that's the two tough moments. <laughs> well, we'd like to thank you for coming on the podcast, Carlos. Uh, I look forward to seeing uh, more of your uh, movies in the future. I hope your next film it gets made as soon as possible. <laughs> thank you, thank you. With the pandemic. And uh, we highly recommend to our audience The Chicken Party on Amazon Prime. Yes, check it out. All right. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Carlos. All Thanks, right. Carlos. Thank you. Horror show exclusive. So what's on our menu for today, Michael? Uh, this one, uh, the... Producer director uh, has been asking me for a while to watch his movie, The Telltale Heart. But we've been doing a lot of interviews, so we finally got around to watching it, and boy, am I glad I did! It's directed and co-written by McLean Linquist, with additional dot dialogue by John Linquist. Uh, it stars Sonny Grimsley, who's a big standout in this film as the narrator, and it's adapted from Edgar Allan Poe's original text, reimagined in the modern world. So. What I, the first thing I want to say about this film is if you do a modern take on an Edgar Allan Poe story, especially one as popular as this and has been done so many times over the years, if, if you look up uh, Telltale Heart, you'll see a long list of adaptations. So if you do something like this now, you better bring it cinematically. And McLean Linquist brought it in this film because it's very cinematic, very effective. The cinematographer, Joseph Olivas, it's his first project. Do you believe that? Look really? how slick slick and rich it looked through the whole thing. The lighting and the, and the angles and everything is so, so just eye-popping, just jumps off the screen. You know, um, when you first told me about this uh, Telltale Heart short film and it's 22 minutes long, I was a little bit skeptical of it, and it's because I'm actually a, a big Edgar Allan Poe fan. I've read that sh that story like over 25 times. I'm so familiar with the Telltale Heart, the the inner dialogue, the the that's going on in the character's head monologue, I should say, the inner monologue, yeah. and the way it's done. I was just like, I don't know, man. That's such a classic story, and it's been done to death. And I don't know. It just seems to be so of its time. But he really managed to do it in a way that it keeps the essence of the time that it was created while adapting it right for a new world. And I was kind of blown away by the cinematic style of the movie. The cinematography is as good as any Hollywood production that's out there right now. Truly creative mm -hmm. camera work and a lot of uh, spectacular images. The editing of this uh, short film is superb. Like this yeah, uh, incredible editing skills being displayed. Yes, Raymond Delmar and Joel Petri. They did the editing? Yes. Oh, man, they did a spectacular a spectacular job. I was kind of blown away because a lot of short films like this, especially on the lower end, you rarely see um, such a surplus of cinematic style in films like this. And the fact that this movie is this short movie is loaded with style kind of blew me away. Yeah. I want to see what this team of people does with either an original film or an adaption, but a feature length movie. Yeah, and what about those slow fades that they do? Very slow fade, where the character from the last scene is superimposed between the characters in the following scene. And it's just a slow transition and that, that the character's face lingers on the screen. I thought that was so effective. I, I couldn't even understand how you even come up with the idea, that idea and know it's gonna be that effective. And it works really well. Um, yeah. There's nothing about this that looks like it's a low budget project, honestly. That's what kind of uh, kind of amazed me most about it. Uh, especially the special effects makeup. The the key special effects makeup artist was Chris Hansen. He did uh, Adam Green's Frozen. He worked on the collection, Hellboy, Underworld, Lost Highway. So th that, Highway? yeah. So you could really tell that that was an experienced person working on those special effects the old age makeup holy shit that looked like a decrepit old man dude and he was like nasty and original looking too with that with that the weird blue eye and then the the severed head is one of the best severed heads i've ever seen in a horror film it looks so real and then all the 
part, the random images of the hand with the eye in it, everything just just bombard your senses throughout the whole thing, and you're you're lulled into this uh, like Edgar Allan Poe's writing is very poetic, and then he kind of hits you, and then the the filmmaker kind of hits you with his images while you're lulled into this uh, this uh, you know poetic kind of world, you know. Yeah, I, I think they did a really, really good job. I mean, that makes sense now that I know who did the makeup effects, why it looks spectacular. I mean, that beating heart uh, looks just as good as any removed beating heart that I've ever seen in any vampire movies. And um, yeah. really um, a lot gorier than I anticipated with some of the shocking imagery, like the image of the eyeball hanging out of his, uh, kind of hanging out of its socket. And the interesting way that they cut things here and there because the makeup is pretty good but there's like a scene in the bathtub where you get the idea that the old man is chopped into pieces in the bathtub but you don't quite see it because the camera angle starts from a high angle and pans down just perfectly enough that you get a teaser of it where you yes. start to visualize it in your head so it's a good combination of showing the audience gore and then letting them build it up in their mind as well Usually you only get one or the other. A lot of the times when the filmmakers try to hide things, it's because they don't have the budget to try to do these gore effects, but they did. They just decided to show you a lot and then tease your imagination even further. Really effective. And the, and the sound design is so seamless. You feel like you see it. You, see, you feel like you see even, even the stuff that's not on screen. You feel like you see it because of the excellent sound design. Mm -hmm. the, just the, the, entire, the, the sound of the whole thing, just the way it was put together, the sound design and the music, and the music was this mixture of electronic music with an orchestra and then heavy guitars come in and just at the just at the right times it just a perfect storm of like cinematography sound design special effects makeup of the location the the location in ogden utah how impressive was that mm -hmm. and and to get a location that beautiful and that stark looking and to use it to your ultimate advantage with every shot that was really impressed with as well yeah really good short film is there any way the audience could watch it uh no i believe it's uh it's in a festival run now we had to see it on a private screener so look out for this in festivals the telltale heart and, and we'll, uh, we'll keep it posted to our page as well for anybody who follows up as soon as this is available for a wider audience to see we'll definitely put it out there and share it with you. Cause I think um, it's definitely worth seeing. And so much to like in, in such a short running time. He packed a lot into that thing. He, he probably could have drawn it out into a feature and it'd still be entertaining. Yes. Oh, how did you like that uh, sequence with the cops knocking on the door and the guys coming into the door and then the, the hallway kind of extends like that? I it thought that was really effective. Of, um, the infamous vertigo shots that Alfred Hitchcock popularized and like Steven Spielberg used in Jaws. Yeah. But it's taken to a much more extreme end and it, imagine, it manages to take an effect that we're all familiar with and make it even more drawn out and adds to the film's level of surrealism because it genuinely looks like the short hallway begins to stretch out. I felt like I was actually watching the house stretch and be quiet and right before our eyes the way that it does it really puts you inside um the character's head uh with the with yeah. the particular visual really impressive so that was again that was uh directed and co-written by mclean linquist so be on the lookout for the telltale of heart by mclean linquist it's an excellent film so what's next on the menu no pun intended <laughs> Now we move on to one that James and I both slept on for years, and we didn't see it until Joe Bob showed it. Cannibal Holocaust from 1980, directed by Ruggiero Diodato, written by Gianfranco Clarisi. It's about a docu documentary film crew that ventures into an uncharted part of the Amazon rainforest to film a documentary about the indigenous people, and then they disappear. So a rescue crew goes in to find them, and finds the only the footage that they shot before they died. So it's the the beginning of the found footage genre. Even though most of it was not found footage, it was half half in 35 millimeter where they showed the rescue uh, the rescue mission going into 
save these documentary filmmakers and then when they find the footage you actually watch the footage which is in 16 millimeter so um this is one of the most legendary and notorious exploitation horror movies of all time and with good reason it's shocking even by the standards of today it's extremely well made and there's a certain level of realism in here that's really disturbing um one of the things it's most notable for is the on-screen animal killings of uh, the torture of a giant tortoise or a turtle as well as like bashing monkeys brains in and it's every bit as disturbing and sickening as you heard it was yeah, the, the the thing that shocked me the most about it, because I'd heard about it over the years, and uh, I'd heard every story imaginable about imaginable about it. I heard about the the director who was uh, who was arrested because the authorities thought that it was real. So he done a movie that was so good they thought it was real. But I thought it would be this really grainy, really uh, exploitation type of film. But when I see how slick it was. The acting's good, the cinematography is good, the sound is good, everything is so clear and and detailed and effective, almost too effective because of the the content that they show. And I love how it does not play out like you think it will. And even after all these years of hearing about it, it still played out nothing like I thought it would. And it's got these big swells of music and high production value, it's very well made. But and then the, uh, I love how they show the 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 natives com committing atrocities, like small atrocities in the beginning, and then the narrative completely shifts as the story plays out. And then you see that the you know it's not quite what you thought it was. These natives aren't quite they aren't the savages that you were led to believe in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So uh, I love the whole twist of the story like that. Um, like you said earlier, the director, um, oh, he had to actually drag the cast out to court to prove that he didn't make a snuff film because he was being put on trial for murder. And um, he also had made the actors um, sign something where they would disappear for a year, like yeah. off the grid to make it seem a little bit more realistic. And for all the movie is effective and everything... I hate to sound, and as a horror fan, I know I'm going to get a lot of shit for this. I hate to sound like uptight or a prude. I have to be completely honest about my feelings about this movie. I kind of hate it, in all honesty. I think it's very effective for what it is, and I think that its reputation is there for a reason. However, um, I'm all for extreme graphic. I don't believe in censorship, and I would never censor a film like this, so I don't agree with that. Um, I really do have a hard time with those animal killings. And the particular one that um, really sickened me was the torturing of that turtle, the tortoise, where they basically hack it and reveal, take its shell off and reveal the insides of this turtle. And you could see yeah. every part of the insides of the turtle working and the camera lingers on it a little bit. And it's the type of torture that it put an animal through that I do not find excusable, excusable no matter what. Your people are capable of crafting graphic imagery. And if you're creative with makeup, you can make some really effective shit. That to me is their put to shock factor for no good reason. They could have accomplished a lot of that without it. It's kind of gross to watch. And as somebody who doesn't believe in the torture of animals, especially such senseless torture of animals, it's a little bit much for my taste. I have a problem with the monkeys being bashed in. It's just, there's so many things that I have trouble with, especially ethically and morally with how the film was made. It's not necessarily that the content, you know, I've seen plenty of extreme films and I can handle it and everything. But uh, uh, another aspect that bothered me about it was besides the, the torture of animals, was that famous image that everybody's seen of the, the cover. It's most one of the most notorious posters in horror history. Yeah. Um, that young girl completely nude on a stick as she's being um with like the stick coming out of her mouth that she's there it's a very gruesome graphic and horrifying image come to find out that was actually a 14 year old indigenous girl that they set up for that so i have a hard time swallowing the ethics that went into making this films not just the animal torture uh but also the stripping of an indigenous 14 year old girl for the camera 
is kind of disgusting shock value to me anyway. And I just have a hard time, I don't know what the word is, approving of the way that the film was made to the point that it bothers me a little bit. It bothers me actually quite a bit. Because I understand within certain cultures and I understand with like um, an indigenous culture, they might not see it as a big deal. And you know what I mean? But the fact is that the filmmakers knew better. They knew what they were doing. I could never in good conscience if I were making something, even if, the, even if everybody thought it was okay, strip a 14 year old girl down and pose her in such a shocking, put her in such a shocking image. I was like, you could have used an older actress for that. There's just well, I, so many things I, that wrong with, with the making of this movie that it's, it's hard for me to swallow it. I, I just don't, I just don't feel right. I mean, it bothered me that they did that to a 14 year old girl, girl. Yeah. But it, it also bothers me to feel myself getting more offended than the victim, mm -hmm. you know, because, because the tribe obviously didn't think it was a big deal. And according to the tribe, she was a woman already. She wasn't a little girl to them. Mm -hmm. So, the you know, it's, it's not a big deal to them. And they, they walk around nude all the time. I mean, there's nothing dirty about being nude there's nothing you know yeah. there's nothing dirty about it but it was it was i i admit it was used in a nasty way yeah because you got, yeah the filmmakers knew better but still i find it hard to be more offended than the victim okay i mean i guess i what you're meeting but that combined with the animal torture mm -hmm. on the set see it's not just two ice it's those two things combined that to me give off a level of i don't know what is the word is callousness is the word is to go out and make your film in such a way so maybe you might have a point about not being offended i still don't think it's right whether or not we whether or not the, the tribe doesn't be offensive because you uh we know better than to do something like that it's also the torture of animals i really like i said i don't really see any justification for that i know that they say that the animals were made of food but that torture of that turtle was pretty um excessive and then my my other big problem with this is that the movie ends on this note where it's like moral indignation where it's like are we the true cannibals are we the true monsters and we're supposed to leave the film oh the media is terror like kind of like how the media sensationalized things is terrible it's like bro you're gonna sit there and fucking moralize to me about how terrible the media is while going and stripping a 14-year-old girl nude for your fucking film and putting her on a stick and torturing animals and opening them up from the inside out in really graphic, disgusting ways. So it's not necessarily the content of the movie. We could have animal torturings on films. We can even have nude actresses. We can do anything. And like I said, I don't think that anything is off the table, but there's a certain level of ethics that I think somebody should follow, especially if you want to go on preaching and moralizing I feel that the message is hip hypocritical. It's a little ham-fisted at the end, and it kind of had me rolling my eyes. I was like, dude, you're in no position to be wagging your finger at me. After all that, oh, the media is terrible. The yeah. media is awful. However, I understand why it's such a notorious film and its, its reputation. It is quite a bit more well-made than I thought it was going to be. Like you said, I thought it was going to be a lot grainier and more raw. But there's just so many things about this that rubbed me the wrong way from an ethical point of view that I cannot co-sign off on the behavior uh, uh, on set. Though I do get well, why people like it and I respect it on a certain level, it's not something that I personally have any desire to sit through again. And it's not something I would necessarily recommend to people unless you're really heavily into exploitation. I feel like as a horror fan or as like an exploitation fan, if you're really into like horror and exploitation, you should see the movie at least once. You know what I mean? I don't believe in the erasing of history. We need to acknowledge that this movie was made and we need to acknowledge its impact. So I think for historical purposes, it's a movie that definitely should be preserved. And I think um, if you're up for it, I guarantee, I mean, not everybody's gonna be up for it, even extreme horror fans. I think you owe it to yourself to see it at least once. You know what I mean? Just to see yeah. why its reputation is what it is and why it's made such an impact. Because it's certainly more well made than, um, I guess, like Eli Ross, the uh, the Green Inferno. Yeah. It, it, it's it's more powerfully made than that, and I guess it's um. 
it comes across as like a stronger movie. But Eli Roth, I mean, I know he did like get involved with like real indigenous tribes, but Eli Roth did not go out and torture animals and strip yeah. this girl's nudes to get his to get his film made. So it's just a matter of um your personal ethics, what you believe. And like I said, I don't want to. I also don't want to give the impression. I don't think that people who watch this or who enjoy this are sick or how dare you. I would never, you know, impose that type of uh, the, what I believe on other people. And I certainly know a lot of fans of this film, so I have a, a difficult time trying to discuss my uh, feelings. It's just on a personal level, it doesn't sit right with me. Well, this is a, a very graphic and gory film depicted in, depicted in a very realistic way. There's a lot of uh, rape and torture and murder of humans depicted. But as far as the disturbing factor, it all pales in comparison to these this animal torture, which they, they yeah. kill a muskrat right toward the beginning. Uh, and they kill the turtle as you, they butcher that turtle, as you said, and then they kill a little tarantula. I don't think there was any need in killing a tarantula. Did they actually eat the tarantula? No. And then the, the monkey kill where they had to kill two monkeys to get that shot where they bashed his brains in. I mean, it's, I can't deny how hard it is to watch. Mm. I can't deny the problem that I have with it, but, like I, I told you before, I'm so desensitized by films like uh, a Serbian film and uh, Irre Irreversible, where I can, I was more able to, t like if I would have watched this a few years ago, it, it would have disturbed me and I would have told everybody not to watch it. Mm -hmm. But watching it now, after being desensitized by those other things, I'm like, yes, I have a problem with this animal torture. I don't really have a problem with anything else that happened to humans mm -hmm. because I mean the the 14 year old girl thing was questionable but mm -hmm. there's a fine there's a you know there's a blurry line between yeah I agree right and wrong with with the with yeah. in respect to the to the tribe but uh I just couldn't deny the skill that went into this and just how much respect I had for it as a film. No doubt. Because it's it's powerful. It, I mean, if, if those, if the animal torture was fake, it would be pretty much a masterpiece to me. See, but it's the animal torture that taints it, you know? That, that's my thing. You know how we're talking about um, the, the blurry lines between the 14-year-old girl? Now, if that had happened and there no more animal tor no animal torture on the set, I still would have looked at it as questionable, but I would have been like, okay, maybe it wasn't the most ethical thing and maybe it was questionable. However, for context, it's who's really being harmed. It's that in conjunction with the animal torture. It's not just the thing, if it were isolated by yeah. itself, I might actually think a little bit differently, not so harsh. It's just the two things combined give me the impression of a callousness and attitude in approaching the material in a certain recklessness in the way it was made. And I guess that's, that's its appeal. I mean, the, the recklessness yeah. with what's made and a lot of art is made unethically and questionably. And um, it's, a, it's a movie I really wrestle with my feelings with it because if the animal, uh, tor if the animal torture scenes had been faked and they'd used, um, you, know, uh, you know, used makeup or something or something really creative, I might have felt a lot differently about the movie. I probably still would have been disturbed by it, but I wouldn't feel, I guess, I don't want to say offended is the right word, but I wouldn't feel the level of um, moral indignation that I do towards it if it weren't for that aspect. It's just a, a, a couple of things, but I mean, as a piece of cinema, it's one of the strongest exploitation movies I've ever seen. If I want to, if I were to remove my personal feelings from the project and the, the, ethics and the morals behind the making of it there's no doubting when it comes to like exploitation films and exploitation uh filmmaking this has to sit at the top of the pile in terms of effectiveness and the way that it sticks with you and the way that it really gets inside your head the the scene with the girl on the spike that's that that infamous scene that's on the cover the reason that was so effective for me is that it's it's not only effective visually it's effective in the narrative of the, of the film because you really get right then the, the, the message of the film was delivered hard for me. 
-hmm. when they went and seen that girl on the spike, they just got through brutally raping this girl and, and torturing her. So then the tribe is the one that actually puts her on the stake because she's tainted to them mm -hmm. because she's, she's dirty now. She's uh, unclean. Yeah. So they put her on that spike. So after these fucking documentary filmmaker people, they torture all these animals and they torture, they rape and torture this poor girl and they look at her hanging on the spike. Oh, I'm disgusted at these savages. Oh, it just showed you the hypocrisy of people like that. And it, I think it drove the message home, mm -hmm. but I, I think it, it, um, but like you said, is a, is a little heavy handed. It, it, it ended up driving the, the message of home a little too far, kind of like, kind of like sticks it into you and grinds it into you. you know? <laughs> it does. It, it drives the message home really strong, but in a way that strikes me as a little hypocritical. That's just how yeah. I feel. If I were to make, I mean, this is just me. I, you cannot tell other artists how to make their film. I don't, I don't believe in that. I believe in respecting the artist, but, um, Personally, if I were to try to make a film with such a strong moral message, I would try to do it. I would try to make the film very ethically. Otherwise, I personally would feel like a hypocrite for trying to push this message out while acting unethically in my own way. Yeah. And only that, I, I don't have the stomach to torture animals either. That's that's just yeah. So I would never even go that far. But it's it's hard for me to justify it because most of the things done in this film is some stuff that I would never do as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. I would, I would never depict such realistic rape scenes and torture. And I would never do that to a 14 year old girl, you know, and I would certainly never even harm an animal, much less kill them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's hard to take myself as a filmmaker out of it and, and judge it just for the merits of the filmmaking itself. It's, it's very hard, but, in the end, I just can't deny how good it is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's 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 a good movie. It's a really solid movie with a bunch of fucked up shit in it. <laughs> it definitely earns its spot in a horror movie and exploitation history. That that that's for sure. And, and it was it was kind of funny to see Joe Bob be so careful with it. He was so <laughs> extra careful to talk about it because he had to talk about the merits of it and how good the filmmaking was, but he also you know, you almost have to take issue with the things that happen in it, you know? Yeah, I think, um, and it's one of those movies that's just going to depend on what your personal threshold is. You know what I mean? Because, yeah. let's be honest, the movie's made, the movie's done, it was filmed mm -hmm. years ago, it's already part of history. You're not, um, I don't think that by sitting down and deciding to watch it, you're engaging in anything immoral. You're watching something that's already been made, that's already part of history. There's no yeah. reason to like, you know, I don't believe in like um, getting rid of films or banning them for the offensive content or anything like that. Just put it into context. Like a weird yeah. comparison is that controversy with the um, Gone with the Wind, which obviously the movie does feature very problematic stereotypes. And especially by today's standards, I understand why it's offensive. So I understand why a streaming service would want to take it off for a little bit just so they could put an introduction and to put it in, in yeah. context. So I don't believe in the erasing of it. And that's also I think what the good thing that, that Joe Bob does, he puts it into context, into historical context and helps to kind of diffuse and explain the situations, the culture it was made in, the circumstances and, and everything. So I, I don't think that uh, people are, immoral for watching this movie just because it's not something that i enjoy watching like i said the movie's already made we're not going to change that it's what's done yeah. but well, also now that i finally watched it i want to weigh in on the argument that this was the first found footage film and not blair witch after watching it i still con consider the blair witch project to be the very first found footage film you know it, it I don't think it really compares to Cannibal Holocaust. Yes, it involved found footage, mm -hmm. but it was mostly a 35 millimeter film, very well shot. And then even the found footage, a, a, much of the 16 millimeter found footage was well shot. It looks good. It, it, it the way it plays out is, is like a, like a film. It doesn't feel like, uh, 
like they just like like the Blair Witch does, which is entirely found footage. I think they took the concept of found footage and made it something completely different. So I don't really consider this along the same lines as the Blair Witch Project. I don't. This is not the first found footage film. However, I would say it kind of um, has the DNA of found footage, maybe kind of like the grandfather of found footage films in the same way yeah. that Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho is not the first slasher movie by any means. But it's yeah. definitely the grandfather of slasher movies and it's kind of, uh, it springs off from Psycho's roots. The same way that Led Zeppelin is not really a metal band. I mean, some people will try to tell me that they're metal. To me, they're a rock and roll band, but yeah. they influenced a lot of metal and people took the concepts, the more metal aspects of Led Zeppelin and expanded it in their music. So I, I would use the same kind of uh, comparison with regards to whether or not this is actually the first found footage film. I think if you were to make, I don't know, if you were to, like, to, to make a documentary or discuss the history of found footage film, you'd have to start off with discussing with this movie and how the genre has its roots in it, but it is not the first full-blown found footage movie. Yeah, because uh, uh, for the most part, Cannibal Holocaust is a, is a standard cinematic film, like a movie, mm -hmm. where the Blair Witch Project, you really got the feel like somebody went in and found this footage because... I actually thought it was real at first. I'm one of the people that thought it was real when I first saw it. A lot of people did. So that's more full-blown found footage. This is like a teaser, kind of a precursor to the genre that, uh, you know, that gave it a lot of influence. Yeah. Powerful movie. Not for me, though. Divisive, for sure. Divisive. With good reason. With good reason. <laughs> Some hardcore horror fans, when they hear this, they're probably going to be pissed off at my take and everything. I was like, I just want to be clear. This is just my opinion. This is how I feel about it. Um, I'm not, like I said, I'm not moralizing or telling you what's right or what's wrong or anything like that. This is just my personal feelings towards, uh, feelings about it. If you like it, uh, there's no problem with that. I totally get why. Another thing that was pretty disturbing about it is how gleefully they killed, the, especially the turtle. Mm -hmm. Just the look of glee on their faces as they ripped it apart. It was ugh. Because you can tell they really enjoyed it. Because, like, the the lead actor, like, they wanted to put a fake turtle in there. Mm -hmm. And the lead actor insisted on doing it to a real one. So that just yeah, left a bad taste in my mouth. It seems like there was a lot of um, questionable, be questionable, be questionable behavior on multiple parties. Yeah. <laughs> it's not just the director. There was... A moral attitude that seemed to pervade the set that I find a little bit troubling. Yeah, I mean the the director had some decent excuses, but it's still not enough for me. You know that the that the tribes ate the animals and stuff, but still. Yeah, it is what it is, and for better or for worse, Cannibal Holocaust is a permanent fixture in horror film and exploitation history. That's all we have for you today for our podcast. Uh. Keep tuning in to us every week. We're going to be having more interviews coming up in the future. Lots more exciting stuff. Um, Michael Pickle, look out for uh, Michael Pickle's uh, uh, feature film debut, Pay Up. Um, we don't know how the situation is going to be with the festival circuit and everything because of our COVID and the lockdown. But still look out for it. We're going to be pushing out into the world regardless. And we are currently working on another film for Michael. Producing one. Very interesting very powerful and I think uh, has a lot of potential. I don't want to reveal too much about it, but um, yeah. I think your film is going to have a lot of potential, Michael. Did yeah. I, shocking true story. I, I just went through like two to three weeks of heavy research. Uh, it's, it's about a tragedy in my family. I won't tell you much more than that. But uh, after I gathered all the research, after I gathered all the research, I wrote the treatment for it. Uh, James really liked it. It's looking really good so far. And uh, so we're going to continue on that. So hopefully this uh, uh, COVID-19 won't, won't extend that out too much. Because yes. my, my dad's 81 years old, and he's the one that wanted me to make it. So I want to make it for him. Yes. And uh, look out for uh, – look uh, just keep, with the, keep, us, uh, keep up with us on our pages on Facebook and Instagram. What's the Facebook page? Facebook.com slash Pickles Horror Show or Instagram.com slash Pickles Horror Show. And we're also on YouTube. Yes. So keep up with our page. Keep up with our YouTube. 
Um, we're on Apple. We're on SoundCloud. And we are in the process of transferring our entire library to Spotify and Anchor. So look out. We're, we're, we're still unsure of the fate of uh, the TV series, Pickles Horror Show. But we'll keep you, keep you uh, updated on that no matter what happens. But I do want to keep it going because we had a lot of fun with that show. We did. We did. And, you know, a lot of possibilities in the future. Yeah. Keep up with everything. Till next week, folks. Happy horror. Happy horror.